Tonight, we're defending the environment, investigating problems in our community. Holding people accountable, asking the tough questions. What exactly is this mysterious substance? What started as a minor traffic inconvenience along 696 quickly became known as toxic ooze and turned into a possible environmental crisis. We have permitted corporate polluters to get away with um, polluting the environment that we all rely on. Tonight, we're taking you inside the investigation. So who made the mistake? Who's being held responsible for that? Well, th this is an this is a issue that has been ongoing for decades. Gary Sayers, the man at the center of the controversy and his business that was filled with dangerous chemicals for decades. Gary Sayers was able to operate like this for so long. So and it was decades, never decades. So how do we it's figure outrageous. out how to prevent that from happening again? Now, as we wait to learn the potential environmental impact, we're working to make sure something like this never happens again. She wants to have a clean environment when she goes out and plays. And the Detroit River, one of the world's busiest waterways, a treasure for the state and especially the city. But what's occurring along its riverfront is dangerous. I wasn't surprised to hear that the thing caved in. Illegal. It did not round up on the city's radar, and we're taking steps to make sure this doesn't happen again. And mind-blowing. It also was just crazy to think about um, such a large chunk of it collapsing and the response just really being inadequate. A dock collapse, contaminated soil spilling into the river, and the discovery of illegal business being done in the city of Detroit and leaders unaware of what's going on right under their noses. Uh, certainly, we, we take a, a share of responsibility. It's a story of big business ignoring the rules. You guys don't have a permit to operate. And Detroiters paying the price. Business as usual for industry and then the communities that sit amongst the industry suffer. Tonight, as we defend the environment, we're taking you inside the neighborhoods, feeling the impact of these two environmental messes in Metro Detroit. Good evening. I'm Local 4 Defender, Karen Drew. And I'm Help Me Hank Consumer Investigator, Hank Winchester. In the next hour, we'll bring you up to speed on our reporting and also break new ground on these big investigations. We're digging into the toxic ooze investigation, a dangerous chemical seeping onto a major roadway. But we begin with the November 26 dock collapse, sending contaminated soil into the Detroit River. In fact, it was uranium and heavy metals that were in that soil. And after some digging, the defenders found the business responsible for the dock collapse was operating illegally. The rush of the Detroit River. You can feel and hear the energy. A resource fueling the success of Detroit and the state. A resource being abused by big business. We don't want to be another Flint two years down the line find out that we've been drinking lead or radiation or whatever else may be a contaminant that was contained in that soil. Teresa Landrum is a lifelong Delray resident. She raised her five children in this riverfront neighborhood and now cares for her one-year-old grandchild. I worried, and so yes, I, I call myself being a proactive grandmother. She's worried about what happened 10 weeks ago here along Jefferson Avenue at the Revere Dock site, which leases its property to Detroit Bulk Storage. After we found out, we were told that it wasn't an emergency. And I'm saying to myself, how it's not emer an emergency? Something collapsed in our waterway that provides our drinking water. That something that collapsed was a dock. The result, soil contaminated with uranium and other heavy metals spilled into the Detroit River. It took days for the city of Detroit to be notified of the accident, and the public had no idea. That is, until news reports started to air. But with the help of Drone 4, we're able to go up and over and get a bird's eye view at the contaminated part of this property and you can see all sorts of heavy machinery frantically trying to restore a shoreline that collapsed into the Detroit River more than a week ago. The owner tells me they had unloaded a cargo from the dock and a day and a half of rain later, the dock failed, collapsing the seawall into the river. The immediate concern, now that contaminated soil has fallen into the Detroit River, was there immediate danger to our drinking water? Well, anytime you talk about drinking water or possible impacts on drinking water, it's an urgent issue. Meantime, residents near the spill are left in the dark. Scott Brines has lived here for 17 years. He, like his neighbors, had no idea what had happened. I think it's the constant uh, problem of neglect. 
and this this uh, this community in particular, because we are largely industrial and largely forgotten because there are very few people left here. The defenders will later find out the city actually didn't know about the spill for days. Why weren't residents notified? Why didn't the company notify authorities? And so we have a lot of questions. Officials from Eagle arrive on site a week after the dock collapse and spill into the river. Officials test the Detroit River water in three different spots with one major question on everyone's mind. Is the water safe? Should the public be concerned? That's very irresponsible. I think it should be very concerning to the Eagle and uh, EPA and all concerned. Greg Ward is the president of the Detroit Windsor Truck Ferry. He runs his business along the Detroit River and is very concerned about what his neighbors are doing. We know objectively there's contamination in the soil and we know that soil is being eroded into the Detroit River every minute as the river water rushes against the soil. We're talking about this spot along the Detroit Riverfront, known as the Revere Copper Site. Listed for decades as a contaminated site due to its use of uranium and other dangerous chemicals back in the 40s during the race to build the world's first atomic bomb. They found all these chemicals in the soil. We know that's there. That's not somebody's memory. That's objective material. And all that's in the river right now. And more of it and more of it is going into the river as this sinkhole continues to progress. The defenders flew our drone over the area and look at the sinkhole size. This is becoming very deep. Mm -hmm. um, and it's a brighter green. And it's a brighter green. Days after preliminary tests are done at the site, results come in. Well, the water. Gary Brown is the director of Detroit's water and sewage department. So is the water safe? That's what everyone wants to know. Yes, the water is safe. Is It is as safe today as it was before the spill that took place on the riverfront as it is after the spill. Brown went before city council telling leaders the water was safe. So what went into that river either solidified and went down to the bottom or worst case scenario, it went further uh, you know, upstream towards Toledo. City council members furious they were not notified about the dock collapse and spill into the river. You have a site that has been known to be a contaminated site for years, years and years and decades. And the community that, that knows that there's a problem out there and they don't know what the problem is and nobody is notified of anything. And I think that there needs to be better means of communication somewhere along the line. But there will be something else revealed in this city council meeting that will make heads spin. What, what actions have been taken since then, given that they were operating illegally without a permit? You heard right. The property owner, Revere Dock, and the leasee, Detroit Bulk Storage, had no permission to operate. But that didn't stop them. They had no permit or anything whatsoever to operate a uh, uh, outdoor storage facility on that property. So you've got Revere Copper, you've got Detroit Bulk yes. running a business yes. for years without a permit, and it doesn't wind up on the city's radar. It did not wind up on the city's radar, and we're taking steps to make sure this doesn't happen again. According to the city, Revere Copper LLC bought the property back in 2015, leased it to Detroit Bulk Storage. The issue, neither had permission to store aggregate on the land. After the heavy weight of the illegal construction material they were storing collapsed a dock this past November and then formed this huge sinkhole, the city said it issued a violation notice on December 6th. They had to provide a structural analysis of the property uh, as it relates to um, what's the, the storage of the material and how it affects the, the land underneath. And they also had to remove everything off that property. And did they respond? Uh, they did not respond. So the city waited a month to issue blight tickets. I find it interesting that the blight tickets are issued right when we started reporting on the story. Coincidence? Um, it's, it is a coincidence. The fact that this is happening has got to make me wonder how many other people are operating without a license. Um, that's Can a you say most assuredly that everyone else is operating legally? No, I can't say that. Okay, but we are going to address every uh, complaint that we have. Where's the problem? Why isn't this being caught? Because there's got to be either a lack of people, lack of money, lack of concern. Well, I really believe that you've, you've got, um, we, 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 we send inspectors out. We believed that, that um, like most cities, 
getting out and inspecting every two years approximately is enough. But as we found out in this particular situation, um, working on the riverfront is, is every two years is not acceptable. Now, since that interview with the director of Detroit's Building Safety, Engineering and Environmental Department, the city has started taking action, sending out teams of inspectors along the riverfront to find out if other businesses are operating illegally, like Revere Dock and Detroit Bulk Storage have been doing. Well, the defenders have learned in the past three weeks, the city has completed 152 inspections along the riverfront. Five of those properties have been operating with unsafe conditions and no certificate of compliance. Inspectors found three businesses actually operating illegally. City has issued 401 violations to those five properties with emergency violations totaling $162,895. And Karen, one property operating without a permit was Nicholson Terminal on Jefferson Avenue. This company on our radar because we noticed a huge pile of limestone on that property and wondered if they had the permit to store the aggregate. So we did some checking and they did not. After the defenders brought the illegal business to the city's attention, we were told Nicholson Terminal would be fined. That fine increasing every day. Now the bill is over 69 grand in penalties. I can tell you when I showed up at that riverfront terminal that seemed to be operating as usual, this is what happened when I started asking questions. So they can't be on cruise. Oh, we're getting kicked off the property? No, you ain't getting kicked off. Oh. That's it, no. no one wants to talk about operating without a permit? Another example of businesses simply ignoring the city and opening up shop without a permit. It makes you wonder, Karen, that it's been over two and a half months since that dock collapse and spo soil spill into the river. And you have to wonder whether those issues have been corrected. So many people are wondering that. The defenders did some digging. Not only have they not corrected the violations, we learned they're not paying their bills to the city. It looks like business as usual here at Detroit Bulk Storage. And let's see if they talk. I see a guy in security. He's probably going to try to kick me off. You guys don't have a permit to operate. Uh, and as I guess, security told me to leave the property. Illegal. But not before I asked the guard to make a call. I wanted to talk to Noel Fry from Detroit Bulk Storage. That's him a few years ago from a CBC interview. He's listed in the violation paperwork we found. Fry told the guard to tell me he wasn't interested in an interview. As I left, I noticed this hanging from the fence. All right, take a look. This is City of Detroit blight violation. And take a look at this right here. Occupancy of building premises or structure not maintained in suitable sanitary and safe condition. And look at this blight violation. No one even picked it up. It's wet. It's been sitting in here for days. Clearly the company doesn't care. They had no permit or anything whatsoever to operate a uh, uh, outdoor storage facility on that property. That's not all. The defenders discovered Revere Dock owes the city more than 35 grand in unpaid drainage bills. This was brought to our attention. We brought it to your department, and at that time, no one knew that this bill wasn't paid. Yeah. How does that happen? Well, we have 440,000 accounts in, you know, in our billing system. Yeah, but you get a resident who doesn't pay their water bill, they're shut off. The lawsuit contends this property where this green sinkhole was formed after spilling contaminated soil into the river remains unsafe, blighted, public nuisance and danger to the safety and welfare of the public. The suit goes on to state the property is not permitted, illegally stored aggregate, and there is the possibility that it may cause collapse and further contaminate the natural waterway. Revere Dock LLC is owned by Steve Erickson. His headquarters are here in Muskegon, so the defenders headed there looking for answers. We're going to show up and see if we can get anyone from the company to talk to us. Looking for Steve Erickson or anyone on his behalf that could talk about um, some lawsuits that are going on involving this company. We're told he's not at work. Hmm, maybe he's at home. All right, this is where Steve Erickson lives. Nice fancy house on the lake. Let's see if he'll answer our questions. No answer. Our calls and emails also ignored. 
Since that dock collapsed 10 weeks ago, environmental activists have been pushing the city to increase inspections as well as state and federal officials to, to continue to test that contaminated area. Yeah, that green sinkhole is still deepening. Last measurement shows it's 12 feet deep, and we know the contaminated soil filled with uranium actually surrounds the sinkhole. So if it collapses and spills into the water, it leaves you wondering what else will pour into the river. Officials from EPA and Eagle have been at the site and so have our local four defender cameras. We'll take you behind the scenes as they test the property's safety coming up. We want to make sure that we have a, a valid plan in place that so we can, you know, allay public fears, obviously, about what's happening at the site. And later, our Defending the Environment special turns to the toxic ooze investigation. She wants to have a clean environment once she goes out and plays. Cancer-causing chemicals from a Madison Heights business seeping onto 696. It's not right for people to have to live in fear about oozing and dripping things on, in their neighborhoods. In our next half hour, what our Help Me Hank investigation is revealing about the concerns for people living nearby. Honestly, I'm mystified. I, I just, as I say, if uranium going into the Detroit River is not considered a priority, what is the priority then? So what are their priorities? The Macomb County Public Works Commissioner voicing her concern and how the state has reacted to the environmental mess along the river. And I think the governor needs to step into this a bit uh, and, and, and make sure that she feels com confident that what her agency is doing there is, uh, is adequate and at the federal level as well with the EPA certainly. The Great Lakes Water Authority has released results from the river and all the contaminants found were at acceptable levels. But still, the EPA and Eagle want more testing done to not only check the river, but also check that property for radiation, as well as what is really going on with that green sinkhole that is getting deeper and deeper. So what is being done to fix the environmental mess and this growing green sinkhole? The color is quite bizarre. It's this green, funky color, which is different from the river. Greg Ward is keeping a close eye on what's going on not too far down the river from his ferry business. Experts from Eagle have been at the site doing underwater mapping to see exactly how much contaminated soil has gone into the river. This whole situation has been very concerning. Nick Asendelft is from Michigan's Department of Environment, Great Lakes and Energy, or Eagle. We met right in front of the site collecting all those violations. So we want to make sure that we have a, a valid plan in place that so we can, you know, allay public fears, obviously, about what's happening at the site. The downriver water intakes have been sampled, the sediment's been sampled, the Detroit River's been sampled, the embankment's been sampled, the pond has been sampled. All those results show that there were no threat to the public. But even with that information, the EPA says more testing needs to be done. We're resampling the pond just to make sure that we've not missed anything. The local Ford Defender drone spotted this black van going back and forth on the property. It was testing for radiation. This big black box is a big giant detector pack. The health physicist explained how it worked. This could tell the difference between uranium metal and um, uranium like you would find in prospecting. Okay. The EPA is also using ground penetrating radar to find potential basements. Now remember, this site had a laboratory on it back in the 40s to build uranium rods that were supposed to be used in the making of the first atomic bomb. Well, there's conflicting information about basements here, you know, but there are some change orders that talk about crushed concrete put into a basement. So, you know, I don't know the answer. Right. There might is, but that's why we're looking. Meantime, Revere Dock and Detroit Bulk Storage have submitted two different remediation plans to correct this mess and clean it up. Both have been deemed inadequate. The company did install that 20-foot barrier you see around the spill site. We flew our drone over the barrier just a couple days ago, and you can see it's just blowing in the wind. While it took Eagle just a few days to determine the barrier was not doing its job. Eagle also went on to say that growing green sinkhole on the property was not evaluated adequately and may be allowing additional materials from the property, including the contaminated soils, to enter the river. Coming up, we're talking with lawmakers and local leaders on the mistakes that were made along the Detroit River and what needs to be done right now to make sure this never happens again. And I want folks to know all throughout the state, it's not just Detroit water. This is water. This is where your water from your faucet comes from. Uh, you're all exposed to this. We're all interconnected. 
So we don't have the power, they know that. We live in a low income community. They say they're a forgotten community, trying to raise their families in the middle of environmental chaos that seemed to go unchecked. We've been bombarded with uh, companies come here, doing whatever they want, when they want. And you know, when you get out into that community in Delray, you really feel for the people living there. The neighborhood is empty. Many who could afford to move out have, but the ones remaining are many times left in the dark as to what is going on at the businesses that surround them that affect their quality of life. We've been asking for help. Help and please stop doing this to the residents. Candid Leone raised her five children here in the Delray community and now cares for her grandchildren. I'm worried for my grandchildren. She, like her neighbors, are worried about the quality of life, living in the shadows of the Ambassador Bridge, dealing with daily truck traffic, and now a growing green sinkhole surrounded by contaminated soil that is spilling into the Detroit River. These residents are worried, and so are local lawmakers. I think a lot of people are frustrated with how it was handled. Detroit Councilwoman Raquel Castaneda Lopez wants to see better communication. Remember, it took days for the city to be notified about the November 26th dock collapse. Homeland Security has to tweak the system and chain of command and communication to make sure that people are aware of situations like this. The Councilwoman is also worried about what is told to City Council and what is actually done. In this 2015 video the defenders obtained, an Erickson representative talks to council about building a seawall if they are approved to purchase the Revere Dock site. So the, um, I mean, roughly 5.6, um, 3 million being for the barge slip of the railroad operation, and then uh, 2.6 for the remaining seawall replacement, the closing 5.6 million. The, the immediate phase would be approximately $8 million for this first initial, and which is on the drawings. But in the actual purchase agreement, there was no commitment of building a seawall. And I wish now today that we would have had more information because I would have voted differently on that. But we know verbally they were committed to and discussed. So that's something we're still investigating to see how that fell through the cracks because those were commitments that were made. And I don't, just don't think Revere Dock is serious about it, neither is Detroit Bulk Storage. I sat down with U.S. Representative Rashida Tlaib to talk about what's going on in her district and in the Detroit River. I mean, this is this is our source of water, and these are you know forever chemicals. These are these are not kinds of chemicals that you can come and it's like you can just wipe it away. Tlaib wants the city of Detroit to keep a better eye on businesses, making sure they're permitted to do business, and also wants the city to crack down on these companies not paying their bills to the city. Remember the site along Jefferson with the sinkhole? It owes more than 35 grand in drainage fees. The city was unaware until the defenders exposed the unpaid bill. You know, when I watch my residents get their water shut off, uh, losing their homes for less than $1,000, and now they are seeing a company like this that, you know, thinks it's a free for all, like, you know, it has been really difficult for a lot of our residents. A challenged community outraged. They say there seems to be different rules for residents and businesses. I, I do care for me and for my grandchildren, and then I do care for the other ones. So why this government is not care about us? Well, here is the latest. City of Detroit says it is willing to make some changes, including requiring regular inspections of the shoreline every five years. The city is making a list of heavily contaminated parcels along the Detroit and Rouge Rivers, and then will make that accessible to the public. The city also saying it will now reconsider handing out permits to repeat offenders. I posted all that the city is committing to to change on our website at clickondetroit.com, and of course, we will be holding them accountable. Coming up next, our Defending the Environment special shifts to the toxic ooze investigation. How we got here, what's at stake, and also what is the plan moving forward? Now, this is all playing out right in front of your business. What kind of communication have you had from the EPA no. or from Eagle? Nothing, Nothing no. at all. But nobody's come over and said, hey, you may have heard there's a toxic substance across the street. No, no one's reached out. I don't, I don't know if anyone's, I think we're just getting all of our information from the news and what people share on Facebook. The toxic ooze investigation. This is an issue that has 
been ongoing for decades. Which is, and that's what blows my mind. Hazardous chemicals leaking onto the roadway from the inside a building that's been a danger for decades. Gary Sayers has been on the radar uh, with almost every agency since the 90s. Yes. And are you disappointed that something wasn't done sooner to control his issue with that building? Absolutely. How was the man responsible for this toxic dump allowed to operate for so long? And are those living and working nearby in danger? We're asking the question, how is the water being affected? And how are state agencies going to make sure this never happens again? And tonight we are taking you inside this very bizarre and disturbing investigation. Gary Sayers, the man who caused this mess, was able to operate for years, even though many knew what was happening was dangerous. Now there's plenty of work being done now to investigate his past and why he was allowed to operate this way for so long. And the one thing that everybody can agree on in this investigation is that this cannot happen again. This is the man at the center of the controversy, Gary Sayers, seen here leaving court after being sentenced in Detroit last November, guilty of illegally storing hazardous materials inside his Madison Heights business. On this day, few could have predicted that this case, which got little attention, would soon become a major controversy and cause for concern for thousands in our area. It would force investigations into how this problem was allowed to drag on for decades. Friday, December 20th, it happened. The green news started seeping onto 696. At first, nobody knew what it was and where it was coming from. What started as a minor traffic inconvenience soon turned into a possible environmental crisis. The amount of chemicals and what was left behind, the owner is paying a price for. Soon, investigators revealed what was coming from the business just above the roadway. The substance, hexavalent chromium, it's toxic, it's dangerous. It's the chemical that launched the legal action in California that was the basis for the movie Aaron Brockovich. By the way, we had that water brought in special for you folks. Came from Well and Hinkley. <laughs> the business electroplating services. It operated here in Madison Heights for years. The owner, Gary Sayers. But what no one knew is that Sayers was no stranger to local, state, and federal investigators. In fact, he'd been on the radar for years, and little was done to stop him or his illegal actions until now. What we're doing from a department perspective is doing um, a detailed analysis on what uh, kind of brought us to today to understand where are there improvements in our process, what do we need, if we need something from the legislature, what is that? In 1996, the DEQ inspected electroplating services and determined there were environmental issues and concerns. Sayers was issued a letter of warning and warned continuously for years throughout the 90s and the 2000s, Sayers under the microscope. The DEQ, the EPA, and the city of Madison Heights all concerned. We now know one of the major problems during this time, the agencies were not sharing much material with one another, and local leaders were left with almost no information. No one really knew what was happening inside. This facility has been cited by the MDEQ as far back as 1996. Um, it was cited numerous times, and to my um, knowledge, the city was never notified of that. But when you have somebody that is a constant repeater or a reoccurring situation, they have multiple violations, you know, reach out to us. We know more about what's going on in our community than people at the state do. Finally, in December of 2016, the state orders Sayers to shut down. The city of Madison Heights revokes his occupancy permit. In February of 2017, the criminal investigation gets underway. But it wasn't until February of 2019 that Sayers would plead guilty to one count of felony hazardous waste storage. Testing was getting underway in Madison Heights along with the cleanup. And as that moved forward, another major bombshell. A major new development taking place in the city of Detroit. The mayor's office taking the proactive move today, entering into a building owned by Gary Sayers. Inside, they discovered something very concerning a substance that on visual inspection looks incredibly similar to the toxic ooze that was seeping onto the roadway here behind me. Sayers had other properties and they were filled with other unknown substances in Detroit, 
in Sanilac. Investigators following the trail and following up with former employees, neighbors, and business associates. The ground, the water, the air quality. Was there an environmental danger for those who lived or worked nearby? Nobody from a state agency has knocked on a door, sent a letter, said, oh, by the way, you know the green ooze that you see just a few blocks away? It's okay. How come nobody's reached out to people that live there? We are working with um, you know, our partners and we are planning upcoming uh, town hall meetings. We understand there is concern. Like the water crisis in Flint, a major flaw in this investigation, communication or the lack of it. Finally, earlier this week, a town hall in Madison Heights to walk people through the timeline and share what's being done to keep them safe. The Madison Heights and Detroit building are now secure. The EPA and Eagle continue to take samples and gauge the impact of this environmental mess. So far, the good news is that the early testing shows the environmental impact appears low for now. But there's a lot we still don't know, and many people are still concerned by what may be exposed as this continues to move forward. With it like being in the ground for how who knows how long that it's been just draining through there, what kind of long term effects and if we're already feeling any effects. Gary Sayers has plenty of time to think about his actions. He's in federal prison in West Virginia. Now the city of Madison Heights remains in a court battle with Sayers. The city is hoping to prove that not only should that building be torn down, but that Gary Sayers should pay for all the work. We don't expect a decision until April. Now, the building owned by Sayers is in an industrial area, but there are people who live nearby, just a block away. And there's many other business owners in that area who had concerns about Sayers for years. So now we take a look at the toxic dump and how it could affect those who work near that building and also those who call that area home. Hexavalent chromium, cyanide, trichloroethylene, the list of chemicals synonymous with the toxic green ooze. Breaking news in the toxic ooze investigation. Today, the EPA on site working to get more information about what may be in the ground. While lawmakers, politicians and organizations all sound off. It's not right for people to have to live in fear about oozing and dripping things on, in their neighborhoods. Everything that we're hearing is that it's safe. The city is going to test water again, but there's also different tests that we're looking at and the uh, hexavalent chromium is not something that's in some of the standard tests. It's a preliminary assessment from the EPA that says if released to groundwater under the building, hazardous and volatile substances could have migrated to nearby active businesses or private residents. Well, that caught my attention. I wanted to talk to the people who could be most affected. With it like being in the ground for how, who knows how long that it's been just draining through there. Um, you know, how long it's been like that and what kind of long-term effects and if we're already feeling any effects. It's more of it just getting you know, destroying it and, and, and contaminating, you know, the rivers and the stream. You just don't want other situations to happen like this around this and also decreases the value of the home. So it makes people not want to move to the area. And Kevin White is a local high school science teacher and father. His concerns, not only that his home value could plummet, but that the environment he's raising his daughter in is a danger. She wants to have a clean environment once she goes out and plays. So when the summer hits, we want to go run around outside. We want to make sure that it's all clean out there. The air is still good, that the chemicals haven't broken down and gotten into our air. We don't want that to happen. While most people live about a block away from the spot where the ooze first spilled out onto 696, businesses are operating just across the street. And business owners not only worried, but also frustrated. This is all playing out right in front of your business. What kind of communication have you had from the EPA Nothing. or from Eagle? Nothing. Nothing no. at all. No. Nobody's come over and said, hey, you may have heard there's a toxic substance across the Never. street. Never. Yeah. Isn't that surprising? It is very surprising. For me to watch this guy with stuff that has cancerous uh, substance who's hoarding it in his building and why he's not getting rid of it properly like it's supposed to be is beyond me. In court, the city has been showing images of the pipes underneath the electroplating services building. They're eroded, broken down from the chemicals, even coated in the green ooze we've come to see and know. You're looking at the, the earth underneath the pipe. So the pipe is gone? The pipe is gone. They all uh, lead to the Red Run drain, okay. Clinton River, and Lake St. Clair. So if, for example, brown water is contaminated 
uh, and it got into the storm sewer system, would that contaminated groundwater enter the storm sewer system and be carried to the Red Run drain, the Clinton River and Lake St. Clair? That's correct. As time goes on, we've been assured that the public health and safety of the people in Madison Heights is a top priority. But what damage has already been done? What about the possible thousands of other hazardous sites across the state? And how has our environment already taken a hit from the actions of Gary Sayers and electroplating services? We should mention the soil samples taken from Sanilac County came back with very similar results. Anything that was found was under the standard level. People, though, are still concerned considering they get their water from the wells. They don't want this mess on Gary Sayers' property to seep into the soil. So they won't be happy until everything is cleaned up properly. Well, when we think about our environment here in Michigan, we obviously think about water and water safety, especially after what we saw play out in the city of Flint. And many have concerns the chemicals that Sayers had stored could impact the water quality. So just what got into the water supply and when? And tonight, a very frank and honest conversation with Macomb County Public Works Commissioner Candace Miller. And in this case, uh, it was a huge oops. Uh, and of course, it, it, it makes you question. It certainly uh, raises a question of how many oopses are there. Candace Miller knows clean water and politics. The former U.S. rep, Michigan Secretary of State, and current Macomb County Public Works Commissioner watched in amazement, like all of us, as toxic ooze seeped onto 696 in December of last year. She also immediately thought, how could this affect water quality in Metro Detroit? In a state like Michigan, the Great Lakes state, where water quality in the Great Lakes is in our DNA, I think we need to be very concerned. All the testing so far has shown little environmental impact or impact on overall water quality. But Miller is still concerned and says you should be too. I had huge amounts of concern about the amount of chromium-6 that was coming down. Could it get into Lake St. Clair? Is it in Lake St. Clair? Has it been already leachating into Lake St. Clair? And uh, when I had Egel say that, don't worry about it, because by the time it reaches Lake St. Clair, it'll be so diluted, it won't be a problem. I really didn't think that was the correct answer from the Department of the Environment to say that, you know, dilution is a solution, because it is not. That was not the correct answer, in my opinion. Miller also critical of Eagle, the EPA, and others who didn't shut down Gary Sayers sooner. What can be learned to make sure this does not happen again? I think in the case of Eggle, I know everybody calls him Eagle, but there's no A, so I call him Eggle. Okay. And uh, really, as I've tried to observe what they've been doing, and I could give you instances here in Macomb County, not about a green ooze situation, but other kinds of things uh, that I would think they would be engaged in, and they're really not. I think as I've watched sort of what they're doing here, they're so siloed in their agency. One doesn't know what the other one is doing. They don't communicate amongst themselves particularly well. I'm sure they're all nice people. I'm sure many of them are extremely well qualified for the jobs that they're doing. I'm sure they put their heart into their job. But you know you have to have some leadership here. With Flint, Miller says we learned a lack of communication and information sharing early on created big issues. And she believes it once again is creating concern with the ooze situation. She says it's up to all of us to demand that Lansing and the EPA do everything possible to ensure our water quality remains top notch. I do think now with all of the public heightened awareness of this site uh, that the correct uh, action is being taken. It's unfortunate you have to rise to this level of public awareness before they're, they're reacting as they have and at which, as I say, begs the question, how many other sites are there? Always interesting to get her perspective. Candace Miller says Macomb County will continue to do its own water testing to ensure that the water there is safe. Coming up, what can be done to make sure this never happens again? We are getting answers. Our coverage continues after the break. Meantime, we want to leave you with a way to contact the state or federal government if you see something happening in your neighborhood. Here are numbers for the Pollution Emergency Alert System in Michigan and the National Response Center. The EPA also has a way for you to report an environmental problem online. You can find a link to that and these phone numbers on clickondetroit.com.
So what can be done now to stop the next Gary Sayers or to stop those unpermitted businesses from operating along the river? And what can we learn about this situation to make sure it doesn't happen again? So tonight we are talking to lawmakers who can not only crack down on illegal dumpers across the state, but they can also work to make sure that they operate legally. And if they don't, that there are tough criminal ramifications. The ooze, the possible contamination, and the big concern. One thing everyone agrees on, what happened in Madison Heights and also in Detroit cannot happen again. Gary Sayers was allowed to operate an illegal and toxic dumping ground for decades. And even though he was warned and fined, he ignored most of those threats. I think the one thing that has surprised me the most is that Gary Sayers was able to operate like this for so long and so was decades, never stopped. Decades. So how do we it's figure outrageous. out how to prevent that from happening again? Well, what we need to do is a couple things. Number one, we need to fund the EPA cleanup efforts. And sometimes that's been a partisan thing. Some budget proposals recently have not included money for the EPA to do its job. I hope this moment shows that whether you're a Republican or a Democrat, we need to fund the EPA to do these cleanups. Even more importantly, we need to pass reforms so that the polluters pay for this and not the taxpayers. Representative Andy Levin also knows an investigation needs to be done to determine who dropped the ball here. Why were these different agencies not sharing critical information with each other and also local leaders in Madison Heights and the city of Detroit? Everybody agreed he was bad. Why wasn't he put out of business 20 years ago? Totally. I don't think this local government can be very much held responsible. Right. They don't have any enforcement powers right. in this. But hey, the state and the federal governments that slapped him on the wrist over and over or that gave him, sent him a letter, you know, that kind of thing. You cannot let someone be carting around super toxic substances in a way that's illegal, dumping them in your ground in a way that's illegal, and not do anything about it. Thank you for your testimony today. Those on the ground in Madison Heights say that critical information collected by the state was never fully shared. The people living and working nearby Sayers were left in the dark. It seems like the concern was that this guy was on the radar since the mid-90s, violation after violation, yet nothing is done until ooze is coming out of the building in 2019. Yep, completely agree. We have a huge effort around processes to understand how do we move more quickly, how do we do a better job. I, again, as I said earlier, I think there are examples of where we've done a much better job communicating, and I think there's always an ability to get even better at communications, and we've seen some of those things highlighted here today. You know, we take that as constructive learning opportunities. We're going to get better. The governor is now asking for a full investigation. She wants to know who knew what and when. And as you can imagine, for those in Madison Heights, like the mayor pro tem, they're frustrated, concerned that the city wasn't fully aware of what was happening in their own community. Are you disappointed that something wasn't done sooner to control his issue with that building? Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, we, we have a situation where the city has very limited power. People think there's a lot of things that we can do, but we, we are limited in our power. We can't go into his private property and we can't have him stop his business because we want to do it. The, the state oversees that and as was mentioned today he was the second of only three businesses that have been closed down in the state that's ridiculous that that, that should have been sent down years ago the concern now there could be others like gary sayers still operating in this way and how can they be tracked how can they be stopped it is now getting the attention of lawmakers on every level epa and eagle have to work together so that we actually have plans to clean up sites. Still to come, a look at other properties in Detroit that are a big concern. And representatives from Eagle join us to answer our questions live. Coming up next. Tonight, we have looked at how we got here with the Detroit River contamination and the toxic ooze investigation, but we want to take a look at what's going to happen moving forward. We now know contaminated sites in Michigan are a problem the state is looking to fix. Let's take a look at the numbers. Statewide, there are roughly 24,000 properties that are contaminated at various degrees. Moving closer to home here in southeastern Michigan, there are 9,000. Of those, 60 properties will be remediated with state funding every single year and 750 will be cleaned up by the responsible party. 
Joining us here this evening to talk about the situation, Jill Greenberg. Uh, she's with Eagle. I've been talking with Jill regarding the ongoing ooze investigation. And Nick Asendelft has been talking with me a lot about the river contamination. He, too, is from Eagle. You guys have been very busy. Yes, we thank you for your time. And Jill, I think the one thing everybody wants to know is what can be done to make sure that there's not another Gary Sayers situation. Right. Well, Eagle's really looking to improve its IT infrastructure. When the EPS contamination broke, I walked into a room with files that were three feet tall, paper files. Um, and this is really archaic. We need to have a modern computer system that allows for cross-referencing and categorization of these sites. And the, the work is, is you know, continuing there in Madison Heights, but this is a long-term project. Well, well, yeah, I mean, really at this point, we're still triaging the site. Yeah. We've determined that it's not moving uh, south into Hazel Park, but we still have to determine the perimeter of the contamination and come up with a long-term solution. I think what you mentioned, Jill, about communication is also an issue we were dealing with when we were talking with Eagle in terms of we found out about this collapse, Army Corps of Engineers, but it doesn't trickle down to the city or to your agency for days. That's right, and you know that's something that we're taking a look at and something we want to take a look at from day one is how do we improve that communication so that all the agencies are on the same page. If someone hears about something, everyone else knows about it, and we all can react in the appropriate manner. Let's talk about the shoreline. The city came out and said, okay, we're going to start doing some inspections. What can Eagle do to assist so something like this doesn't happen again? Well, we certainly want to lend any kind of expertise that we have in that. Um, you know, protecting waterways and protecting air and soil are obviously our mission. So. If that uh, is that, if that's part of the inspection regimen and anything that we expertise that we can have and offer, we certainly would be happy to help out. You just need to get the power in terms of you need to be have that be permitted. Well, that's certainly another thing. I mean, we can only do so much as as what's in statute or what uh, gives us the regulatory power. So, if that changes in some way, then maybe there are other options down the line in terms of what we can do. And the agencies also need to figure out a way to communicate better with one another. Eagle, the EPA, the local level. It seems like in both cases that was a little bit of a problem too. Yeah, we've been real happy with uh, our partnership with the EPA, especially on the Detroit Riverfront. They've been very helpful and they've been able to offer us some expertise that, that's been very good for us. Right, and we've been uh, reaching out to local communities. We had a town hall this past week, attracted 300 people where we were able to answer you know, and address a lot of their concerns. All right, well, we do appreciate your time and all the work you've been doing, and we will be obviously in touch because, as you said, there are some other contaminated sites that need to be addressed, and as we have been reporting, we're finding out a lot of companies that are operating along the riverfront that don't have permits, which obviously has got to raise concerns for Eagle. Yeah, mm -hmm. concerns uh, across the board for right. the people living in these communities and also, I know, for, for both of you. We thank you for your time tonight. Well, thanks for having thank me. You. Thank yeah. you. And you can watch all of our past coverage and keep up with mm -hmm. the new developments that we are breaking on our website on clickondetroit.com. There you're also going to find stories that you won't see on air, like how the sinkhole site is connected to the Manhattan Project, the making of the first atomic bomb. You can find all that information on clickondetroit.com slash environment. And the local four defenders and Help Me Hank are committed to defending the environment. We're going to keep asking those tough questions and also keep watching to see where our investigations take us next. We thank you for tuning in tonight. Have a great night.